All righty. So hello, everyone, and welcome to our chat with an expert on what to do and say when someone we care about is grieving. So this is the fourth and last episode of this grief series with Rachel Weinstein, brought to you by the JCA Baptist Wellness Connection, a partnership between the Jewish Community Alliance uh, and Baptist Health to provide JCA members and the surrounding community with a variety of wellness services. Uh, my name is Skylar Tucker, the moderator today, and I'm the site coordinator and one of the Baptist Health wellness coaches at the Wellness Connection at the JCA. All right, so for those who are new to our series, our guest Rachel Weinstein has a master's in education and is a grief specialist and educator in the Jacksonville area. She's the founder of Jacksonville Center for Grief and Loss and her website jacksgrief.com provides support, education and consultation for grief, loss and life change. So it's nice to see you again, Rachel. Thank you, Skylar. Always a pleasure to be with you. All right. Yeah, I still can't believe this is our last session, but I know, but we'll do other things. <laughs> oh, definitely. Yes. So, um, Rachel, so tell us about the Jacksonville Center for Grief and Loss and what you do. Sure. So I founded the Jacksonville Center for Grief and Loss, which really is just me. Um, but I do a variety of things in addition to support, education and consultation for grief, loss and life change. I see individuals. I see couples, families. Um, most of uh, the clients that I have are adults, but I have seen some children as well. I started my career as a general therapist and um, early in my career, I found that I was always kind of frustrated with always looking for in traditional therapy. You, you're really trained to look for dysfunction, to look for mental illness, to um, diagnose, make a treatment plan for what might not be working or might be dysfunctional. But um, my way of approaching life tends to be more um, looking for what's normal and natural. Um, I, I just have always tended to do that. And so I was kind of the student in my graduate school saying, well, what if, you know, what about grief? Or, you know, what if that particular thing is just normal and it's not hurting anybody? And how do you work with that? And so it's always just been my approach in general. And I found that because grief is such a normal process, but nobody um, is really trained in how to support it, there's a big difference um, between how a therapist might approach grief and how somebody specifically trained in grief would do it. So as a grief counselor, um, which I've come to embrace solely versus all kinds of other things that I used to do, um, I'm really helping people to feel heard and normalize their experience and give them some really practical strategies for coping with all the, the experiences that they have in grief, physical, emotional, um, intellectual, spiritual, it impacts all of us, not just our emotions. So um, it was really just after a loss that I encountered myself that I discovered that I really wanted to, um, uh, I wanted to be part of the solution by being a resource to people in grief and not um, have them go through what I did, which was sitting in front of somebody who was not trained and who was kind of looking for dysfunction and made me feel more isolated. So it's been my passion for almost 25 years. And that's why I founded the center when I moved to Jacksonville uh, from California. I wanted something available um, to those in grief in the community. So that's a long answer to your question. Yeah, well, no, that's fantastic, Rachel. Thank you so much for sharing that. Absolutely. So um, I guess to ensure we're all on the same page. So mm -hmm. can you define grief? What is that? Right. So a lot of people think of grief only as related to death and dying. And um, in truth, grief is a natural and normal experience in response to any loss or change. If we have cared about the person, the relationship, the job, um, the animal and it, that relationship is broken, has changed, is different than we grieve. Um, there's a saying amongst grief counselors that grief is the price we pay for loving and investing. And so grief encompasses so much more than death and dying. When we talk about death and dying, we typically use the word bereavement as, the, as what we go through. And that's relegated just to physical death. But grief is much more broad for the purposes of today, I'm pretty much going to be focused on death and dying versus all kinds of loss, 
because I want to talk about certain things that I think relate best to the aftermath of a physical death. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Rachel. Sure. So, so why this topic of grief? So specifically, well, first of all, I talk about grief because not a lot of people do. Ironically, it's something everybody in our lives, all of us will encounter grief and loss. And yet none of us, ironically, are remotely prepared to uh, as much as we could be prepared for what we'll be going through, what someone we care about will be going through, what to do, what to say. Um, I think when it comes to this particular topic about what to say um, beyond I'm sorry for your loss to someone who's grieving, I really think it's important for people to have practical information about things like what to write in a condolence note, what to say in person to somebody, whether it's a friend, a coworker, an acquaintance. Um, and then lastly, how to really truly listen. I mean, I know that everybody knows how to listen, but to, to listen to someone who's grieving in a way that helps them feel heard is so important. And I, I think there's just some practical information that we all need to be able to do that. Very nice. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So I know that there's a few topics that we're gonna probably hit on today. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular one you wanna start first? Um, yeah, or... um, so let me, if I may, let me just share my screen because yeah, sure. most of the time you and I just have a conversation, but I wanted um, to, to share a slide deck with everybody. Okay, so so first and foremost, let me see here. Okay. Oops. Perfect. All right. So first and foremost, what I want to share with everyone is that grieving people, what, what they want most, what we want most when we're grieving is to feel heard, not to be fixed. So I don't want anybody listening to feel like you've got to find the, just the right words to say to people because it's not what you say that matters. It's how you ultimately communicate that that um, they've been heard, that they can be the way they feel without needing to cover it up. We've got a culture of quick fixes and people who just don't have time to hear that we're anything other than fine. So if you have helped someone really feel heard in their grief, they will remember that. They will feel their, their soul will just be a little bit soothed in that moment. So it's not about fixing them. You're not gonna have magic words that take anything away, but um, I will give you some words regardless um, because I think we need them. Um, so first and foremost, I just wanna communicate that. But I, I do wanna talk about what to write, what to say, and how to listen. So first of all, why don't we just get into the condolence card? Um, I'm sorry to say that as we um, have a whole new generation of people that are much more um, uh, comfortable with electronics, with with social media and with phones, the condolence card is um, something that our parents may be more familiar with than, than we are, but it's really important. Um, and I'll share a little bit about what to do um, and, and what to say, when to do it. First of all, please do write that note, even when you feel awkward. Um, you know, skipping it really can be interpreted as a sign that you don't care about somebody. Um, and that's not the message that you want to send. So I'll help you feel more comfortable about what to, what to say in a card, but please do write it and, and do so as soon as you hear about the death. It's, um, I'm sorry. Okay, um, so it's a time to offer your heartfelt sympathy and to do so as soon as possible is, is a really good idea. If you don't really know the person who's died um, or the family, get a stock printed card, you know, that you can sign or make a personal note. Um, and, you know, when in doubt, send flowers along with the note. Um, Remember that the note is for the living and not the deceased. So even if you didn't get along with the deceased or you didn't know the person at all, it's really appropriate, always appropriate to offer sympathy to the family. Now, as in terms of what to write, first, just tell them you're sorry that they've suffered a lot. Name what the loss is. So I'm so sorry to hear about the death of your child, um, as an example. 
And that this is the essence of your message. It doesn't need to be fancy. It just needs to be said. Let them know that you're there in your thoughts as you struggle with your grief. That's that's plenty. So you don't have to get fancy. That's that's the goal. It's just simple, um, but heartfelt. It's also nice if you have if you did know the person to share a positive memory of thoughtfulness of warmth or of other positive qualities that their loved one possessed. Um, often, sometimes people just can't get through those cards initially, but they go through them later. And to be able to reference how their loved one contributed to life is really important for the bereaved. So um, some general humor can be what the family needs. Now, of course, being careful with this one, I'll just give you an example. I have a good friend who whose father died and um, when he was not doing well and she couldn't she couldn't get to him one day. She was working. I said, I'll go, I'll go be with him. He was in a skilled nursing facility. And um, after he died, we, uh, this wasn't in a card, but it's, it's something I would have written to her in a card. I, I sent her something else. But when we were together, I shared with her that when I was with her dad, um, he had the television on in his room and it was, um, there was some program on and it was kind of getting a little R-rated. And I was really uncomfortable, so I like changed the channel and he grabbed the remote and he changed it back. And she laughed and she was like, that was my dad. You know, she's like, thank you for that memory. I needed that. Like a little, that's what I mean by gentle humor. So a little something that, that um, it doesn't all have to be um, morose. You can interject something that, that might give them a little chuckle and remember how funny their loved one was. Um, but in a note, um, so beyond sharing a positive a positive memory uh, of thoughtfulness, offer some kind of practical help and, and then follow through. Like I'm gonna call or stop by next in the next day or two and find out how I can be of most support to you, babysitting, mail sorting, dealing with phone calls, whatever it is, I'm here for you. Something like that, if you're gonna write a card is always really nice. So a memory offering some kind of practical help as long as you follow through with that, don't even, don't even write it if you can't. If your life is just too busy, that's okay. But it's just a, just an idea. Here's some things to avoid. Um, please don't write, let me know if you need anything. While it's a really popular gesture, it's essentially an empty one because bereaved people are just too busy. They're in too much pain to think of things for you to do. Also, avoid writing anything that makes it sound like the death was a good thing. Like, you know, Mary's finally out of pain. Um, religious sentiments, unless you are absolutely sure that the family shares those beliefs, and this is a big one, you're sure that they're not having a crisis of faith right now in their grief, even if they have been very religious in the past. Um, to non-believers or those whose faith is in crisis, religious sentiments, just might sound empty and make them feel worse. So please avoid religious sentiments. Um, and, you know, essentially condolence cards can be a source of comfort and let sorrowing relatives know that they're not alone. And really with a few simple words, you can let the bereaved know that you care and help them feel less alone. So that's the point of a condolence card and what to, what to write, what to avoid writing. I hope that's pretty clear. Oops. Yeah, those are some good tips there, Rachel. Good, Very good. good tips. Thanks, Tyler. Um, so let's talk a little bit about just what to say. And of course, you're going to tailor what you say to different people. You're going to have a different relationship with a friend than you would to your coworker or your boss or someone who reports to you. Um, or of course, to an acquaintance, someone you just run into. I put that picture up there with, with a grocery card because please, if you see somebody that you haven't run into yet, um, who's lost you know about, but not you don't know them well enough to have reached out, don't stop and take your cart and go the other way just because you're uncomfortable. They see you and they see you avoiding them. So please just keep going. And hopefully what I'll talk about today will help you know, be a little more comfortable about what to say when you when you see them. Um, here's some do's and don'ts. So first, I just acknowledge their loss. The worst thing you can say is nothing at all. Just avoiding it 
because you're afraid that they're going to cry or they're going to get emotional. I will tell you that if somebody's brought to tears because you mentioned a loss, you did not make them cry. You made you touched their heart and made them feel seen and less invisible. And you just gave them permission to be the way they feel. And that's a gift. So please don't panic if somebody, if you mention their loss and, you know, oh, I'm so sorry, I heard that your father died and then they, they get teary. You didn't make them cry. Don't feel like, oh, I'm so sorry, I shouldn't have brought it up. So please know that. Don't, don't avoid mentioning the loss. Be sincere. And I'll tell you, I like to cut off the, I'm sorry for your loss, just halfway there. I'm so sorry. That's enough. It's not that in and of itself, I'm so sorry for your loss or I'm sorry for your loss, but there's anything awful about it. It simply becomes so overly stated that it's become cliche and I think a bit distancing. For me, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry with a period on the end um, is enough. It's simple. It's, it's true. And it's, I don't think enough people are just being halfway. So I, I tend to think it's a little more natural to say that. Um, put yourself in their place, but don't over identify them. It's not a time to launch into your story about your loss. Um, you know, how you suffered as well when your mother died. And it's wonderful that the intention is lovely to be able to connect to them, but it's not the time. So put yourself in your place, have sympathy or empathy, but don't overly identify with them. Have situational awareness. So I'm going to talk about some ways to draw somebody um, out and into sharing their what they're like with you, which can help them feel heard. But don't do that if there's no time or you have no privacy. They're about to go into a big meeting or you're in, in, out in the open. That's not the time. Um, but it doesn't mean you need to avoid all mention of the loss altogether. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. It does. Okay, good. Um, take the lead. Uh, let them take the lead, excuse me, on the level of detail that they share. Please avoid asking questions like, how did he die? Um, was it COVID? Or what happened? You know, let, let them take the lead about just how much detail they may want to share. Um, be more interested with how they're doing. And um, I'll talk about, you know, some things that you can ask of them, uh, but leave the details aside. Um, and then follow their lead with loss language. People ask me all the time, should I say passed away or died or gone to heaven and which one's better? Quite honestly, I, I suggest following their lead. So if they say um, that the, the person, uh, went to heaven, you can do the same. But if they say die, don't say went to heaven because they would, you know, they might need that real language. If um, so, passed away, um, I tend not to use the words passed away. Uh, and, it, you know, just as a grief counselor, I, I think died is real language and, the, and there's a finality to it enough, like just like the word lost. I remember a long time ago when I was supporting a, a young child whose mother said that we're going to, you know, go and see a lady who's going to help us um, because we lost daddy. And she started opening doors in my office. She was like four, three or four years old. And she was looking for her daddy because that's where she was going to find him since he was lost. So the real language is important, um, age appropriate, of course, but I think we need to be real about it. So follow their lead, however. If they're saying, you know, I lost my mom, I lost my dad, that's okay to, to use as well. I'm so sorry that you lost your mom, um, but don't change the language. And then ask them what's hardest for them right now. Or what time of day is the hardest for them right now? That's a clue to what, what um, the ways in which you might be able to help them. Maybe they'll say, gosh, you know what? Mornings are so hard. I, I just don't want to get out of bed. You know, that might be a clue for you to say, gosh, you know what? I totally get that. Um, how about I, I'll give you a call in the morning and we can just talk before you get out of bed and tell me about, you know, just everything that's in your heart that day. Have a real human being to connect to instead of just silence, something like that. Or it could simply be, 
you just park that and say, oh, you know, that that's a hard time of day. Maybe I'll send them a little text to say, I'm thinking of you. I know mornings are hard. It could be something that simple. Um, but just don't respond with, let me know if you need anything. Um, and then please don't use texting or social media as a replacement for togetherness or for an actual phone call. If I could shout that from the rooftops these days, I would. All the um, Facebook posts about, I'm sorry for your loss, and the prayer hands, and um, that's just not the way to, to, we've lost some human touch. There's something important about a card, about a phone call, about a, a, a touch or a look at your face. Um, COVID's made it hard enough for all of us to not have as much human contact. In grief, it's even more isolating. So, um, so I've said about that. Actually, Rachel, I have a question. Sure. If I, if I can. So going sure. back, you were you were saying that um, on the pre could you go back on one previous sure. slide? You said ask them what the um, what's hardest for them right now. Right. Or what time of day? How how would you how could you bring that up? during, I guess, conversation, like, um, organically without it? So, you know, obviously, so I think it, it has, honestly, Skylar, I believe that you can say almost anything to someone if you say it with, gen with sincerity and with compassion in your voice. Um, I think that if your tone is gentle and you're looking at someone in the eye and say, Skylar, What's hardest for you right now? This mm, is a lot. Okay. You know, if, if um, hmm. you're my boss and um, you say to me, gosh, Rachel, what's hardest for you right now? And I'd say, you know, Skylar, um, my, my mom died at two in the afternoon. Every day at two o'clock, I just have a meltdown. It might help me as your, uh, you as my boss. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Say, gosh, you know what? How about every afternoon at two, um, you get some privacy or, or you, you leave at 145. Got it. Okay. It All might right. simply help you um, mm -hmm. know how to support me. But if it's a genuine, you know, you're looking at them, your voice, your tone is gentle. If you're trying to reach into the world and say, gosh, tell me, what's, what's the hardest part for you right now? And I'll tell you why I, I add right now, because it changes all the time. No moment to mo is the same as the moment before. Days don't, you don't, it's not an uphill climb in grief. It's all, you're all up and down. Um, don't pay attention to those stages. They're really, that's a, that's a whole other topic, but those things are, are myths. They're really dimensions that you go in and out of or skip all together. They're not sequential. Um, so I think the question of, you know, what's hardest for you or what's the most challenging for you right now um, is nice because it not only helps you learn a little bit more about them, but every day is going to be different. And I think that the, the question itself can be asked at different times and you'll get different answers. Awesome. Well, thank you for that tip, Rachel. Absolutely. Absolutely. So how to listen to help someone in grief feel really heard. Um, you know, all of us know how to listen or, or a lot of us think we do. <laughs> Depends. Sometimes, you know, uh, I'm not a great listener if, uh, if I'm with family and I'm, I'm triggered or something that I might, you know, run all over them. So no one's a great listener all the time. But when you when you care about somebody and they're grieving, how can you really listen to help them feel heard? That's something I want to talk about. So Harriet Lerner is um, a lovely woman take a look, look her up, but she said something so beautiful, which is wholehearted listening is the greatest spiritual gift you can give the other person. And I really do believe that. So we're going to talk a little bit about how to do just that. How do you listen to someone uh, in a way to help them feel heard? The first thing are questions they can't answer yes or no to. When I was in training, um, my mentor, my professor said to me, um, your goal is to get inside their world to help them shine a light on the things that they're in the dark about because nobody wants to see them or hear them. So if you help somebody um, shine light on those things that they, they um, are forced to hide, not the things that they want to hide, but the things that our culture forces them to kind of keep 
secret or quiet because we other people just can't handle it or back away from it, they will never forget and they will feel heard. So open-ended questions are one way to really help somebody feel heard. Um, of course, you're going to tailor these kinds of things to the relationship itself. Is it an acquaintance? Is it a good friend? Is it a family member? Um, is it a coworker? But open-ended questions are the way to go. So, for example, I, I if you notice, I do leave out the word why because I, I don't think why questions are great. It can kind of um, make us go down the rabbit hole. So I leave why out, but what? So what's hardest for you right now? Or what do you wish more people understood about how you're feeling? Um, my goal is not to make anybody into a grief counselor. It's just about how do you, what do you do after you said, I'm sorry, right? And you still want to connect to the person. It's not about what you'll say. It's about what you invite them to share that's going to help them feel heard and connected. And these are just simply Open-ended questions are ways for you to help them share. That's all they are. Um, who? I often use this one. Who has been a support to you? It tells you lots of things. If they say they have nobody, it's an opportunity to say, I'd like to be someone who, who can support you. You know, or gosh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That sounds so difficult. I'll talk about ways you can answer in a bit. But who is a, a nice one? When? So like we talked about, when is the most challenging time of day for you right now? Um, or, you know, when do you feel most comfortable? Um, if you're in your car, you know, alone or under your covers, <laughs> when, when do you feel safest or where? Where do you feel most comfortable? Or where do you feel um, able to be with your grief in nature or um with your spouse, there are a million possibilities, but how? This one is, there's a big difference between how are you and all of the um, insincerity that can come with that question versus how are you really? Just stopping and looking at them and saying, how are you doing really? Um, and again, it's not to do that when you're in the grocery store and they're welling up with tears. It's something you, know, you be situationally aware. Do you have privacy? Do you have the kind of relationship where um, they would feel safe enough sharing how they're really doing with you? Um, do you have the time to listen to how they're really doing? Um, so the assumption with these questions is that you really care about this person and you want to be there for them. And I, ideally, of course, you have some privacy or you have some time, right? So here are some really practical things to say. Tell me more, right? Tell me more is a great one for a lot, lot of reasons. One, it's if you really don't understand what they've shared and you have a, a million questions about it, tell me more can help you Fill in blanks until you do understand. So that's one. The other is that it invites the person to keep going. And that is something that our culture just doesn't do. If you're the person to say, tell me more instead of, ooh, sorry to hear that. Well, take care. Let me know if you need anything, right? If you're the one to say, gosh, tell me more. That you often, I often hear, hear people do kind of an exhale. Like they, they feel like, oh, they're not having to hold it all in. Um, of course, this is only with sincerity in your heart that you're asking me these things. But again, this is about trying to help someone you care about to feel heard. So that's the assumptions that you care enough to ask these questions. Um, simply saying a statement that's that's um, like a summary, just, gosh, that sounds so, I, I picked hard, but it could be lots of things. That sounds so scary or that that sounds so difficult. That sounds, you know, so confusing, whatever it is. Um, Oh, the doctors don't don't know what happened still. Gosh, that sounds, you know, that sounds so difficult to not have those details. Whatever it is that's coming at you, just do it. You know, that sounds so. Um, next one is, I'm here for you. You are not alone. Um, with sincerity in your heart and in your voice, I think that's a very connecting statement. 
letting them know that you really understand that. Um, not that that you understand exactly what they're going through, because frankly, you can't. But you can understand a feeling. I don't have to have experienced um, the same kind of loss to understand the feeling of loss, right? Um, so be careful with the understanding part. Don't personalize it too much and, ma and make um, make it so that, oh gosh, I know exactly what you're going through. No, you don't. But you can really understand a feeling. Um, and then just something normalizing. That's a natural way to feel. I understand, you know, it's natural to feel overwhelmed. I would as well. And of course, some nonverbals, eye contact, no distractions. Don't be texting or on your phone or looking at the clock or over your shoulder, nodding, you know, using, using sound versus words. What I mean by that is when I was, um, when I was doing some role play, when I was in training, I remember um, my professor, he actually didn't say a word to what I was sharing with him. He, he would, he would say like, after I would share something, he would go, mm. or, you know, tap his heart like, oh, Mm. that often is just a statement of like, wow, I, I got you. I, I get that. That's, that's landed on me. I feel that. Right. So those are things too. It's not just with words. Also silence is okay. Not every gap needs to be filled by you. So let that be there too. Just being with someone being genuinely present and still is a gift as well. This one I love. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget the way you made them feel. And if you help somebody really feel heard and therefore feel supported, you've done something huge. That's a gift. That in and of itself. How many of us get that? Think about those of you who are grieving now, who have grieved in the past, um, think about what people have said to you and the feeling that came afterward. Most of us will forget the words eventually, but we don't forget whether or not that person made us feel heard, seen, acknowledged, connected. That's what I've got for today. Well, that was that was great tips, Rachel. Thank you so much. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I'm happy, so happy to open it up Practice. when you're ready. Yeah. So, all right. So, thank you again, Rachel, for your expertise and knowledge. And so, um, before we go, remind the viewers how they can reach you for your services. Absolutely. So, I've got several ways. My phone number. That's my cell phone, and I'm happy to give it to you here. Four zero eight five four zero. 4950. My email is Jack's Center for Grief. I know it's a mouthful at gmail.com. And my website, where you can also contact me through there, it's easy, is jacksgrief.com. You don't even need the www. But, um, and I will tell you that anybody on the call today who contacts me and just men mentions this presentation, gets a complimentary consultation with me. I don't time those. I will um, listen and find out what you're facing and um, share with you how I might, um, how we might be able to work together or answer questions that you've got um, about how I work and, you know, insurances and those kinds of things. Great. Well, thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Rachel. Absolutely. My pleasure. Thank you for having me here.